Quintet by Gambaro there with Contortion Classicum here on 99.5 WCLT. Of course, we're getting some, some weather coming our way right now. Uh, it sits here in the Boston area anyway. It's going to be raining, thunderstorms for a little bit. And uh, 73 uh, tonight. Tomorrow, 87 is the high, partly sunny, definitely humid. Tomorrow, 79 the high on Friday with some afternoon thunderstorms as well. Cloudy and 83 degrees at a minute till 7 o'clock. Classical Radio Boston is 99.5 WCRB, WCRB HD1 Lowell Boston, also on WGBH HD2 Boston, WCAI HD2 Woods Hole Martha's Vineyard, WJMF, WJMF HD1 Smithfield Providence, a service of Bryant University, a character of success and at classicalwcrb.org. Coming up at 7.35, Debussy's Claire de Lune, and then at 8 o'clock, Alan McClellan starts things off as he will be doing all summer long with an encore broadcast uh, performance of the Boston Symphony Orchestra from Tanglewood. And uh, tonight it's barely a symphony fantastique from 2017 with August Nelson's conducting. Right now, Jakub Russo with the Prague Philharmonia and Dvorak Symphonic Variations on an original theme. Alrighty, 7 o'clock, I am Pastor Rick, and uh, we'll be with you for about one hour tonight, uh, sharing the Word of God. So I want to greet everyone. Um, we're at, we're at uh, New Life Christian Assembly of God in Haverhill, Mass. And uh, greetings to all. Let's see, let, me, let me take a quick look here and see who's on. Hello, James Carter. Hello, Lisa. Joe Franchella in Florida, God bless you, my brother. So good to have you on here. Millie, God bless you. Lorinda, praise the Lord. Edna, God bless you, Edna. Pastor Bill, good to see you here. Pauline, God bless you. Patty Stauffer, Sandy Whitney, glad you're here. Uh, that must be Stacy, New Life Haverhill, uh, pro promote, promoting sisterhood. Uh, and Eva Rogers, very good. God bless you all. All right, let's see. So there's about 14 or 15 people on right now. It'll probably pick up as we get going. Uh, boy, my phone has been going off like crazy lately. Maybe some of you can relate to this. I, I'm on a group text right now. It's my brother, my cousin, my other cousin, his two kids, and somebody else. And man, they're 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 either in New York or Florida, and they or or Virginia. They're just talking. They're going a mile a minute, and um, I'm I'm a victim of being uh, on a group text, and it's been happening all day today. But that's okay. I I, I didn't really participate, but I I like to know that they're having fun anyway. I kind of check to see what they're talking about, just to make sure I'm not missing anything, and. Uh, <laughs> You know, it's politics, it's food, it's what's everybody doing. Uh, you know, it's, a, it's the same old stuff that people do. 
uh, among family members. Anyway, um, good to see you all here. Um, have a few things to talk about. Um, so maybe we should open up with a word of prayer. <clears throat> and then I have a few announcements and stuff to make before we get into the word. We, we will be in Romans chapter 9. Uh, we're going to start at verse number 4 and uh, proceed as far as we get tonight. Uh, Lorinda, you're right. I'm in the group text black hole and I can't get out. I'm sinking and I can't. Somebody help me. I can't get out of here. But anyway, uh, it'll, it'll be okay. All right, let's pray. Let's go to the Lord. Father, Lord God, we love you. We thank you for your grace and your mercy, Lord. Thank you for the rain right now. We certainly need it. Uh, we pray your blessing over tonight's Bible study. We pray, Lord, for anyone that may need a special word from heaven, Lord, that you would speak in such a way that we would hear that word and really apply it to our lives. We pray, Lord, for anyone that may be down in the dumps, maybe anyone who may be physically ill or emotionally stressed out. Uh, we pray for anyone that's uh, dealing with a relationship that's strained or anyone having a financial burden. We just lift it all up before you, Lord, <clears throat> and we pray for your blessing, your anointing, your provision to be there for each and every one of us. So, Lord, we love you. We thank you for this time. And may your word really speak to us very personally tonight and powerfully tonight. We thank you for it. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. All right, uh, a couple of things. So Sisterhood is meeting on Friday, uh, yeah, Friday at 7. So all the ladies, you can contact Stacy about that or check it out on, our, on this Facebook page. Uh, Brotherhood Zoom meeting is uh, tomorrow night, Thursday night at 7. Our brother Wayne Zanke will be heading that up. Uh, I'm not sure who's speaking at these events, but you can find out from the leaders if you want to. Um, also, we have our, our new kids uh, leader, Stacy Amendola Johnson. Uh, hello, Pamela. Hello, Mileta. Uh, Stacy is uh, heading up the kids ministry and uh, really put together a, a really nice uh, video presentation for Sunday, this past Sunday at 1 o'clock. Hello, Valerie. Um, and I want to encourage all the parents to make sure your kids uh, tune in. Uh, you don't have to watch it right at 1 o'clock. You can always go to our YouTube page, New Life Haverhill, and uh, check it out right there at any time. So if 1 o'clock is not working for you, uh, you can check it out later or even Monday morning, anytime during the week. Hello, my brother Tony. God bless you. Uh, so, uh, yeah, so Bobby the Baker was there at the uh, kids' uh, ministry on Sunday. And I think Bobby the Baker will be making a guest appearance, uh, I don't know how often, but uh, probably fairly frequently. So you may want to check out old Bobby from Australia. Uh, okay, I wanted to tell you all also about our brother Sheldon Hunt. Uh, Sheldon... Uh, was just in a nursing home again for, I don't know, how, about a week, I think. But I guess he's doing better now. Uh, but through a series of events that happened, um, he's going to have to uh, relocate uh, to a different uh, facility to live in. And I, I, don't, I forget where he is right now. Uh, it's off exit 52 in Haverhill. I've been there, but I can't uh, think about it. I can't think of the name of it. Haverhill Crossing, maybe. And uh, he'll be leaving there uh, probably not for another month or so. Uh, hello, Diane. God bless you. Diane, wow, good to see you. Diane from Webster, and now you're somewhere. I'm not, not really sure where, but good to see you here. Um, so Sheldon will be relocating. We'll keep you posted on that. He'll be uh, relocating to a facility here in Haverhill, I think on River Street. So we'll give you more info as we, as we find out. Um, also, our brother Jesus uh, Ruiz's uh, sister had passed away, uh, I guess, when was it? Last Friday, I believe it was. Uh, Miriam was 40 years old, and Jesus tells this fantastic story about how his sister had been sick for a long time, but uh, he and, and Wanda had witnessed to her, and she kind of accepted the Lord, but wasn't taking it real seriously as he says, and um, one day last week, she was just about, uh, she was ready to meet the Lord. She, you know, I think she was ready to die, 
and the doctors told everyone she's she you know prepare and miraculously she came to like for, she came to for about another day and in that day that the lord gave her she really made a solid commitment uh to jesus and after that day was over she passed away and she we believe she went to heaven based on her confession of faith so praise the lord for that but anyway uh jesus is trying to raise some money to uh, provide a proper burial for her uh, apparently uh, there was no money in the family there's no there's no resources available so he started a GoFundMe page it's on uh, Jesus's page I think it's on my personal page uh, Rick Amendola on Facebook uh, so if anyone would like to contribute to that please do it's a very worthy cause and we want to be a blessing to the Ru Ruiz family as much as we can uh okay rob simpson so good to see you here god bless you christina bell good to see you here as well uh so uh yeah i've just uh taken a few minutes to greet everyone give you some updates as to what's happening um okay so um i'm, I'm thinking about doing something uh because i'm not really uh uh, not able to meet with a whole lot of people. I mean, I have met with a few people. Uh, we might meet in the church uh, during the week, or we might meet outside under the tree in the shade. Uh, but I was, I was wondering if anyone wanted to meet with me, uh, we could always do a FaceTime thing on our phones, or we could always do um, a Zoom meeting if you'd like. Hello, Katie. God bless you. Glad you're joining us tonight. Um, that's right, Rob. The Lord gave her one extra day to make things right. It was so precious. So if anyone does want to meet with me, talk with me, uh, the phone, the email, the text, uh, Zoom meetings are, are available or a FaceTime meeting is available too. Um, all right, so um, I did want to just mention also that these days uh, are, are, are troublesome days, aren't they? Um, we have the pandemic still happening. I mean, we're, we're pretty good here in Massachusetts, but um, there's still that kind of fear that a lot of people have. Um, Florida, Texas, California, uh, some other of the, uh, of the uh, Midwestern states are really getting hit very, very hard. So we need to pray for that. Uh, we need to pray for the social unrest in our country. Um, you know, I, I've had... I've had people tell me here, here locally, um, they don't want to come to a church that's so politically involved, I guess, uh, just because we kind of took a position uh, to be proactive and trying to make amends with people, trying to reach out to people. Um, I also heard from other people that don't feel comfortable coming here because uh, they, they're afraid there might be some prejudices here. And I tell you, my heart is so grieved over that. If there's ever a, a place where there shouldn't be a prejudice or a fear of prejudice, it should be in the church. So we're working on that. We're trying to do the best we can. Um, I don't consider our church a very political church, uh, but I do consider ourselves a socially active church, which I think is a part of uh, the gospel to be, to be socially aware and active. Uh, so I, I, you know, we're going to go forward with, with that. But anyway, whoever feels comfortable coming to church, please do come. We're still following the mask and the six-foot spacing at the church. Um, we're not having kids ministry per se, but there have been some families that do come that bring their children. And the kids seem to do fine, you know. Uh, but no pressure. Uh, if you would rather stay home and watch on live stream, that's fine or Check it out on YouTube later. That's fine, too. All righty. So let's go to the book of Romans. And uh, we're going to go to chapter 9. And uh, let's see. Rob Simpson, you came to the church. I'm so sorry, my brother. No, we're not meeting. on. We're only meeting on Sunday morning at the church. Everything else is live streamed for right now, so sorry about that. Um, so I want to I want to talk about Ro uh, Romans nine, verses one, two, and three, 
And then I want to pray again. Um, and I'll tell you why I want to pray in just a second. So anyway, Romans 9, um, verses 1, 2, and 3 is really Paul's burden for Israel. Um, we got into this last week a little bit as we were wrapping up. Um, so Paul has a burden. For, he says, I, I tell you the truth, I'm not lying. My conscience also bearing witness with me in the Holy Spirit. I have this great sorrow uh, and, and uh, continual grief in my heart. Um, I could wish that I myself were cursed for, from Christ for my brethren, my countrymen, according to the flesh, who are Israelites. So uh, Paul has a real burden for the Jewish people. And uh, I remember leaving the, uh, the study last week by saying, what is your burden? You know, what, who do you have a burden for? Uh, Paul had a burden for the Jews. That's that really good. Um, I, I want to mention having a burden for the Jews, for Jewish people. I don't think it's out of line uh, to have a burden for Israel, to have a burden for Jerusalem, to have a burden for Jewish people. Now, growing up uh, in the New York, Boston area, uh, we probably have had ample opportunities to go to school, to get acquainted with, to work with people that were Jewish. Uh, looking back on my life, I can remember four individuals very well um, that are Jewish. One was a neighbor of mine uh, when we lived in New York. And uh, I do have a burden, but I'll tell you what, it's a, it's a tough, uh, it's a t as they say, a tough nut to crack to lead a Jewish person to Jesus. Uh, we've got to pray for the Holy Spirit to enlighten people because Otherwise, it's, it's really not going to happen. Many Jewish people, I, I found, are steeped in religion and steeped in the traditions. And to think that they could maintain a, a semblance of Judaism and, and be a Christian is, is beyond them. Although, I, I share as often as I can that you could be Jewish and be Christian. I mean, Christianity is a continuation of being Jewish. Uh, and I always call to mind... Uh, people like uh, Rabbi Jonathan Kahn, uh, who was a Christian, is a Christian rabbi uh, based out of New Jersey. You may have heard of him. He's written several books, uh, several about prophecy. Uh, one book that I love is called The Harbinger. A uh, Harbinger is like a, an alert or a warning. And he talks about the 9-11 uh, attack on the World Trade Center uh, was a harbinger. Uh, of God and of getting everyone's attention. But he's got a very large congregation. He's been used by God in many different ways. Uh, he's been at the National uh, Prayer Breakfast, uh, praying, you know, strong, uh, fervent prayers, uh, leading, leading the church in prayer for our nation. Um, I would also uh, remember uh, Bill Ziegler, dear brother Bill, uh, his wife Mary Ellen, uh, and they represent Chosen People Ministries, uh, they do have a, a local ministry here in Essex County. And so there is a movement uh, in our area uh, for Jewish people that desire or have a hunger uh, for a fulfilling of their Judaism, uh, having, be, having fulfillment in finding Jesus Christ. Uh, so I want to look over at uh, ch Romans chapter 10 for just a second. Uh, Romans 10 Verses 1, 2, 3, and 4. This is Paul speaking here. It says, Brethren, my heart's desire in prayer to God for Israel is that they may be saved. Uh, for I bear, I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. For they, being ignorant of God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted to the righteousness of God. For Christ is, is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. And so I think the same thing can be said today, that many Jewish people have a zeal and have a burden, and uh, they want to serve God. And, and unfortunately, I think a lot of it's steeped in tradition. And um, it's like Jesus, as we're going to get to tonight, hopefully, at the end of chapter 9, Jesus has become a stumbling block. He's the rock of offense. And uh, for many people, they can't get over that and just simply accept Christ Jesus as Messiah. So um, can we just pause for a minute? Hello, Jason. Uh, 
uh, Jay Dacey, God bless you. Um, let's pray for, for Israel. Let's pray for Jerusalem. If you could think of any Jewish people in your life, I, I think of four of them that I know. Uh, I want to just, uh, I won't mention them by name, but I'm just going to pray for them. So let's pray. Father God, Lord, like Paul, we have a burden tonight for Israel. We have a burden for Jerusalem. We have a burden for Jewish people, Lord, the most popula uh, populated uh, city in America with Jewish people is New York City. I think there's more Jews in New York City than there are in Jerusalem or Israel. We just pray, Lord, for your hand to move upon people that are Jewish. We pray, Lord, that, the, that their knowledge, their understanding would expand. And, Lord, you would reveal your power, your love, uh, your, your great concern for them. By giving them a revelation that Jesus Christ is the promised Messiah. And we pray, Lord, also for your church to be a good witness to our Jewish uh, neighbors. That we would love them and, and share God with them in such a way that, that they would understand. And that they would sense our love for them. And Lord, the, the people that I remember, the ones in New York that I remember so well, I pray for them tonight. For those that uh, know Jewish people, Lord, tonight, we pray for them tonight that you would begin to do a work in their lives, that they would somehow open up their heart to, uh, to turn to you and to receive you, Jesus, as their personal Lord and Savior. So thank you, Lord. We leave it in your hands now. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Hello, Tammy Bracewell. Good to have you here tonight. Praise the Lord. We're in uh, Romans chapter 9. So let's Let's start with verse number four. We started this last week, and I um, want to move through this uh, fairly quickly. But Romans 9, verse 4, he's talking about the Israelites, Paul speaking about the Israelites. And he's saying, he's saying, you know, I have a burden for them because there are certain things. He lists seven things here. There are seven things that, that are important to Jewish people, that are important to Jesus, and that are, are important to the church. In other words, if, if you were a Jewish person, you would be halfway there, actually. Everything that's been said, you know, through the prophets, uh, through the law, through Jesus when he was you know, living and teaching, everything kind of paved the way for you, dear Jewish person, to receive Christ as your Savior. It doesn't mean that you're not Jewish anymore in, in that regard. It means that you're a Jew that follows Jesus. Like Jews for Jesus, that's another thing. Um, so he says, okay, certain things pertain to the Israelites. The first thing he says in verse number four is, is the adoption. I know some translations say uh, son, the, the sonship. And, you know, all along, ever since God appeared to Abraham in <clears throat> Genesis chapter 12, when he called Abraham out, you know, and, and through Abraham came, the chosen people, God's chosen people, um, they have been called the sons of God. Uh, Exodus 4, uh, verses 22 and 23, uh, when the Lord speaks to Moses and tells Moses to go speak to Pharaoh to let the people go out of Egypt into their promised land, he said, tell Pharaoh that Israel is my son. They're the firstborn. Israel is my son. And uh, so you could see why many times Paul would say, and it says it in Romans 1, 16 and 17, that the gospel has come to the Jew first and then to the Gentile. And somehow, I think we've gotten away from that, you know, globally, uh, although we do send missionaries to Israel and, and Jerusalem and other, other cities in uh, Israel. But, uh, yeah, but so, so the Jew first and then the Gentile. Um, Let's look at a, a couple of cross-references here. Romans chapter 11, uh, verse 17 uh, through 21. Just a couple of verses. I really like this analogy that Paul gives. Uh, Romans 11, 17. He says, uh, verse 16, actually. He says, uh, the root, the root of the faith is holy, right? Uh, the lump is holy, the root is holy, the, then the branches are holy. So he's saying that the faith, Faith in God is the root, okay? So verse 17, if some of the branches were broken off, all right, 
and you being a wild olive tree were grafted in among them. So you have the root, you have some branches, those are the Jews. Then you have the wild olive tree, that's the Gentiles that are grafted into this root. So we're grafted into the family of Abraham, not by genealogy or by genetics. We're grafted in through faith. But some of the other branches that were there, the Jewish branches, were cut off. So he says, uh, they were grafted in among them, and with them become a partaker of the root and the fatness of the olive tree. So the olive tree is like the, the, uh, the root. So we're a wild olive tree grafted into the olive tree. Olive, you know, symbolic of peace, the prince of peace. Uh, so he says, okay, so do not boast against the, the branches. So you Gentiles, don't boast against the branches that were cut off. Okay? If you boast, remember that you do not support the root, but the root supports you. So the olive tree, the root of faith, supports the wild olive tree. And then it says in verse 19, You will say then, branches were broken off that I might be grafted in. Okay, well said. Because of unbelief, they were broken off, and you stand by faith. Do not be haughty, but fear. For if God did not spare the natural branches, he may not spare you either. So all that to say, the olive tree is, is symbolic of the root of faith, going back to Abraham. Um, there's branches in the root. You know, Those are Jews that accept Christ as Messiah. And then there's the wild olive tree that's grafted in. Those are the Gentiles that had no connection to Abraham whatsoever. Like us, most of us, not all of us, but most of us. But we're grafted into this olive tree. But some of the branches of the olive tree were cut off because they didn't believe in Messiah. And so you, you could say, well, they were cut off so that we could be grafted in. I think the Lord would have preferred that everyone stayed in the, the root and the Gentiles got grafted in as well. But anyway... Um, so anyway, all of that to say, we are sons of God, you know. And, and, and the Jewish people were sons of God before anybody was a son of God. Um, we looked at Romans 8, uh, verses 15 and 16, that um, we, we haven't received the spirit of bondage again, but we've received, received the spirit of adoption, by which we cry out, Abba, Father. And then verse 23, Romans 8, 23, uh, we are still... Uh, groaning and waiting for the redemption of our body, uh, the adoption, the re redemption of our body. So we're adopted spiritually, and we're waiting for that, that adoption to be fulfilled when our body is redeemed at the second coming. So anyway, that whole thing has to do with Israel was, was God's first choice. And so because of that, Paul has a burden that this gospel message would be presented to them and that they would receive the gospel. It seems logical to think that they would receive the gospel. But keep in mind, too, you know, people always ask me, why, why aren't there any Jewish people that are Christians? The whole early church was Jews. You know, the, the 11, the, the 12 apostles, um, the 3,000 that got saved on Pentecost, they were all Jewish people. You know, it wasn't until, what, Acts chapter 8, when the, the Samaritans started to get saved, Acts chapter 10, when the Gentiles started to get, get saved, the early church was all Jewish. And when the Gentiles came in, it took a lot of, you know, talking and praying and seeking out uh, God to accept uh, both the, the Samaritans and the uh, Gentiles that were being grafted into the olive tree. It didn't go well at first. There, were, there was a branch of the, of the Christians called Judaizers that said, well, in order to be a Christian... You have to obey all the law of Moses and then become a Christian. They, in other words, they took it to the farthest extreme. They had to obey the feast days and uh, had to be circumcised and eat certain foods. And Paul and, and Peter and, and, and the leaders in Jerusalem were saying, no, that all that's not necessary to get grafted in. We're grafted in by faith in Jesus Christ. So because of that, he's saying, I have a burden for Israel because of the adoption, because of the sonship. Then he says, also because of the glory. Because of the glory. Now, he just got through talking about in Acts 17 and 18 that uh, if we suffer with Christ, we will also receive the glory. We'll be glorified with Christ. So for the Christian person, Jew or Gentile, we will be, we will be in his glory. We will be glorified with God. And, um, you know, the glory of God is, is, is reserved for us in, in a sense. 
But for the Jewish people, the glory of God was something that they all remember from their forefathers. If you think back, Exodus 40, uh, when the tabernacle was filled with the glory of God. And I'm sure that those stories were passed down from generation to generation. Uh, they would talk about Moses after he met with the Lord, the glory of the Lord was shining on his face. And, and so they understood, you know, the, the glory of God. And, and Paul says in Romans 8, we Christians, you know, we will have that glory with God. We're, we'll be glorified with him. Um, and uh, so, you know, he's saying because you had a taste of that glory before, it seems natural. It seems logical that uh, you would accept Christ and, and, and fulfill that whole aspect of the glory of God coming upon your life. And not just for uh, Moses or for the leaders, but for every person that believes will have that glory. And then he goes into the covenants. Let me just check this over here real quick. Just want to see if I missed anybody. Okay. Ah, okay. I think I missed some comments. I'm sorry about that, but my thing's stuck. Okay. Um, so he talks about the covenants. Okay, because the covenants of God were given to the chosen people, you know, they weren't given to the, the Moabites or the Edomites or the Hittites or the whatever, the Jebusites. The, the oracles of God, the covenants of God were given to the people of God. It's amazing when you think about it that God chose Abraham. And through the line of Abraham, you know, all the covenants that God made with people were made through that family or through that, that nation of Israel, the chosen people. And so Paul says, you know, because you've been given the covenants, it seems logical that you would, you would take on this covenant now. So there's the Abrahamic covenant, Genesis 12, when the Lord said, I've called you, Abraham, I'm going to bless you and your descendants. The whole world will be blessed through you. Uh, just obey me, follow me, and, and you'll be a great blessing to all the world. And certainly that is absolutely true. But that covenant came to the Jewish people. Then the Mosaic Covenant, Exodus 19, when Moses received the, the law and the Ten Commandments, there was a covenant there. You know, you're my people. This is my law. He didn't give it to everybody. He gave it to the, these particular people, um, which, by the way, is the foundation of our own government here in the United States. And most of the Western countries have taken the Ten Commandments and the law to some degree and have fashioned uh, the rule of the land or the, the law of the land based on the, uh, the Old Testament law given to Moses. And then there's the Davidic, Davidic covenant. That's David with an IC, Davidic. Uh, 2 Samuel 7, 4, when the Lord, uh, through Nathan, uh, calls out David and says, through David, I'm going to make an everlasting covenant. And you may remember... Uh, through the, the line of David, uh, Luke chapter 1, we'll get to that later, I think. But uh, through the line of David came the Messiah. So, so those are three covenants, very important. Now, um, in Jeremiah 31, now let, me, let me read this to you if I could find it real quick. Jeremiah 31, there's another covenant here that's promised. Um, the Lord speaking here to Jeremiah, Jeremiah 31, 31. It says, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant. Hallelujah. Artie? I think I missed somebody named Artie, but hello, Artie. Uh, I will make a new covenant with you, with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand and lead them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant which they, which they broke, though I was a husband to them, says the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And, and, and so, so now, fast forward to Matthew 26. We say it every first Sunday of the month when Jesus took the bread, or actually when he took the cup, he said, this is... Already, Charlie, God bless you. Good to have you. Uh, this is the, the cup of the what? Of the new covenant. 
So Jesus is, uh, hey, Joe, God bless. Uh, so the Lord is saying, you know, I'm going to give you a new, you have Abraham's covenant, Moses' covenant, David's covenant. I'm going to give you a new covenant. Jesus said, <clears throat> this is the new covenant. My body broken, my blood shed. This is the new covenant that I'm giving to you now. And so Paul is saying back in Romans 9, 4, um, because of the covenants, I would think that the nation of Israel would be running, running, running to receive Jesus as their Messiah. Okay, then we have back in uh, Romans 9, 4, the giving of the law. You know, Paul saying, look, of all things, you know, you, you have, <coughs> you have the, the sonship, uh, you have uh, the glory and the covenants, but man, you've got the law. The law was given to you. Could you imagine the world, that, by, by the way, without the nation of Israel practicing the law to the best of their ability? They weren't perfect, but none of the other nations had that law. Man, it was every man for himself. And basically, whatever, whatever people thought was best, that's what they did. And there were kingdoms built upon, upon uh, human knowledge, humanism. Israel was the only nation that had a, a God-fearing law. <clears throat> and Paul's saying, because you had the law, man, I would think that you'd want to follow through with the law, because the law, you know the law in and of itself. He spent the first several chapters of the book explaining the law brings you to a dead end, so to speak. But the law brings you to a new thing, which is the blood of Jesus Christ that fulfilled the law. And so the law then, your belief transferred from the law to the belief in Jesus Christ. So I would think that, you know, you <coughs> Jewish people would want to embrace uh, this new covenant. Um, you, you had the law leading you to that. So let's look at Romans 3, verses 1 and 2 real quick here. <clears throat> Remember, we talked about this a few weeks ago. What advantage then has the Jew, or what, what is the profit of circumcision, or what, what good is uh, keeping the law, is what he's saying. Well, he says much in every way. It's, it's good. It's chiefly because to them were committed the oracles of God. So it seemed logical to, and, and Paul, don't forget, Paul was a Jew of Jews. It says in Philippians 3. He was uh, you know, circumcised the eighth day, the tribe of Benjamin. Uh, he knew the law. He was a Pharisee. Uh, he was zealous for the law. He persecuted the church. He was just all into it, you know. Hello, Nancy Belogeron. God bless you. Uh, so, you know, so he's saying it seems logical that, that you, would, uh, you would receive Jesus as your Messiah. Okay, 9-4. The service of God. Some translations say the worship of God. And that reminds me of the Levites, the Levitical priesthood. You ever hear of the Levitical priest? The Levi, there were 12, 12 tribes, the 12 sons of Jacob. And one of the tribes was Levi, right? Levi. Now, the son of uh, one son named Judah uh, was, the, was the family through which David came and through Jesus came. But there's another. You know, another tribe, of another one of the twelve called Levi. And out of Levi were called the Levites, or the Levitical priests. And their job, you know, every tribe had their own little function. But the Levites had their, uh, their function of taking care of the temple. Cleaning it, setting it up. The priests were there to offer the sacrifices, to pray, to intercede, and so forth. So, so they, they had this thing, Paul saying in 9.4... Uh, I would think that you had the worship of God. You had the service of God among you through the Levites. And they set the pace for all the Jewish people to obey the law, to sacrifice their animals, sacrifice their offerings, uh, worship the Lord, and, and uh, keep all the feasts and all the things. The Levites were in charge of all that. But I would think, you know, Paul said, I would think that because you did all of that, it would seem like realistic and logical for you to take that next step and realize that God now, through the blood of Jesus, had made every one of us a priest. We don't need that Levitical priest anymore. But uh, the Lord has made every one of us a priest. And Paul's saying, you know, this, this pertains to you. I would think that you would want to grasp on to Christianity, belief in Jesus, because of your background and all these different things that led up to the acceptance of Christ. 
And then he says that you've had the promises. Well, there's a lot of promises. You know, I, we could spend a whole day, you know, talking about the promises. But basically, I would refer to the, the messianic promises. The promises in the Old Testament. Oh, no caption. Oh, could someone write to Nancy? She, Nancy is hearing impaired. And uh, gee, what could I do to get caption on here? I have no idea. Uh, could someone write to Nancy and let her know I'm, we're so sorry. We don't have that feature available on here. I'll work on it for maybe for next week if I can. But anyway, uh, Paul's saying, you, you've got the promises. You've got, for instance, Isaiah 53. You know, Jesus, you know, let, let me, let's go there for just a second. Isaiah 53 is just a great passage. We refer to it often. But um, who, who has believed our report? Uh, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He, he, Messiah, shall grow up as a tender plant, as a root uh, out of dry ground. He has no form or, or comeliness. And when we see him, uh, there's no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected by men. He's a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we did not esteem him. All, all prophecy relating to the coming Messiah. This is just one chapter. Uh, surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Uh, yet we esteemed him stricken, spitten by God, afflicted. He was wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities, the chastisement for our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. For like sheep, we've all gone astray, we have all have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord has laid upon him the iniquity of us all. And it goes on. But the, the Israelites, the Jews, have received the promises that Messiah is coming. We'll go all the way back to Genesis 3, after Adam and Eve had sinned. Uh, sinned. Uh, what the Lord promised, you know, There'll be enmity between the serpent and the seed of the woman. And through the seed of the woman, one will come one day that will stop that serpent's head and proclaim victory over the serpent. So ever since the, ever since the fall of man, uh, there's been this promise of Messiah coming. And not to mention, when Jesus was teaching, uh, there's two occasions in particular that I could think of. One is in Matthew 12, when uh, he was speaking about Jonah, Old Testament teacher, prophet, you know, and uh, he was saying, as, as it was in the days of Jonah, so will it be when the Son of Man comes. And he uses that, that story of Jonah as like a prophetic word to proclaim his own second coming. Uh, Matthew 24, uh, Jesus says, as were the days of Noah, uh, so it will be when the Son of Man returns. So prophetically, he's using these Old Testament stories to proclaim his second coming. Uh, Paul in Acts 13 uh, begins to teach about David, and uh, through the life of David, he brings about uh, scriptural truth that pertain to today, or to his time and for us for today. So the promises, you know, the promises all came through the nation of Israel. And so Paul's saying, I would think that, you know, because of all these things, it would be easy for you, in a sense, to, to turn to Messiah. And you can almost read between the lines, and we'll get to this as we go through the chapter, but in a way he's saying, you know what, if you don't receive Jesus as Messiah, what could it be? You know, you're steeped in, in the traditions of men, uh, you're steeped in uh, your, 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 uh, uh, your, your status in the community, you don't want to rock the boat, you don't want to disrupt your family traditions, and, and that's keeping you from you know, following Jesus. Wasn't that the whole problem with the Pharisees when Jesus was teaching anyway? They did not want to give him the right, the right time and, and the right opportunity. Although, although there's always a silver lining. There was Nicodemus, who was a Pharisee. He believed. There was Joseph of Arimathea. He believed as well. And uh, there might have been some others. But uh, So then, okay, so at, uh, Romans 9, 4, then... Uh, Verse 5, he, he kind of summarizes this passage, of whom also are the fathers. 
and according uh, and, and and from whom according to the flesh Christ came. So on top of all of that, you have the fathers, you have the patriarchs of the faith. You have Abraham. You have uh, you know you have Moses. You have David. You have the prophets. Um, you have uh, you know Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You have the twelve tribes, the twelve sons of Jacob. You have all the fathers. And through the line of David, I mentioned it earlier uh, in, in Luke 1, when uh, angel Gabriel announced to Mary, Mary, you're going to have a baby. He'll be of the lineage of his father David, the everlasting covenant made with David. The Messiah will come in the flesh through that line, that Davidic line. Uh, he'll come. Uh, in fact, let's look at a couple of things here. Romans chapter 1 and verse number 3. If you want to go back there real quickly. Um Paul is greeting the church in Rome. He says, concerning his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who was born of the seed of David, according to the flesh. So, and then, uh, let's see, Romans 15, and verse number 8, we read this, Romans 15, 8. Now I say that Jesus Christ has become a servant to the circumcision for the truth of God. To confirm the promises made to the fathers. So back in 9.5, Paul's saying, look, you've got the fathers, you've got the patriarchs. And, and through them came Christ in the flesh. You know, physically, in the flesh came Christ, Messiah. And all this was foretold you. Um, and then the end of verse number 5, let's see. Verse number 5. Um, uh, Christ came, who is over all. So he's saying Christ is over all. Uh, so reading between the lines here, he's saying it's no longer Moses. It's no longer Abraham. It's no longer the prophets. It's no longer David. It's all, all connected. But Jesus, the Christ, the Messiah, is over all. And I want to read another passage from Colossians. If you want to turn there with me. Colossians chapter 1. I love this passage, Colossians 1, verse 15. It says that Jesus, Jesus is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created that are in heaven and on the earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created through him and for him. Through him and for him. That includes us, by the way. We're, we're created through Christ. He created everything. And we're created for Christ. He's before all things. And in him, all things consist. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he may have the preeminence. So back in Romans 9, 5, when, when Paul says Christ is over all, absolutely Christ is supreme. He's the head of the church. He's over everything. And then he says uh, at the end of verse number five, the eternally blessed God. So if you're, if you're ever wondering, because people wonder about this, is Jesus God or is Jesus the Son of God? He's both, actually. But here it says he is the eternally blessed God. Hello, Priscilla Hodgson. God bless you. Glad that you're joining us tonight. So there's a lot in that one, that one verse. You know, the fathers, the patriarchs, um, through them came Christ, who is over all, above all things. He's the eternally blessed God. And then he says a word that we're all familiar with. He says, amen. So let it be, amen. You know, that's the end of that. And now I'm going to go on to another, another subject. Actually, it's a, it's a sub-subject of what he's talking about. Uh, okay, so we got through those two verses pretty good. We have about 15 minutes left. So let's see how far we could get with this next passage. Now I have to tell you, this next passage, if we don't discuss it ahead of time, it could be very, how could I say, very boring and a little confusing. But Paul, Paul has a reason for saying the things that he's saying. Uh, so we're talking about verses 9, Romans 9, 6, I'm sorry, Romans 9, 6. All the way through chapter 10 and chapter 11, um, 
1136. So this is what you would call a parenthesis or a digression. Uh, pastors today, including myself, are not the only ones that digress. In other words, we go off on a tangent. Well, most scholars uh, believe that Paul went off on a tangent right here. He digressed. He was talking about the law and grace and the law of Moses and Jesus and all that. And now he's, he's zeroing in on Israel. He, I mean, he's totally focused on Israel. And he comes out of it in chapter 12 by saying a couple of verses that we are familiar with. Uh, it says, I, I, I beseech you, therefore, after all that I just said, you know, which we didn't look at yet, but after all I just said, I beseech you by the mercies of God that you present your bodies as a living sacrifice and that you renew your mind, body and mind. You know, based on everything I'm going to tell you here, based on all that in, in uh, Romans 9, 6 through eleven thirty six. So you have chapter 9, 10, and 11. Based on all that, I beseech you to give your body and give your mind over to the Lord. So what he's saying is a parenthesis, but it is important to understand what he's saying. A lot of times I would have questions about God's plan for Israel. Like, what is God's plan? I, like all the things we just said, they are very important. But I don't see national Israel really repenting and coming to know Christ as Lord. Although there's a movement there. There are Christians in Israel. And absolutely, there's, there's Jewish people here in America that are Christians. But I don't see an overwhelming move of all of Israel coming to Christ, which I would like to see. But I think we could be on safe ground. Uh, I mean, we did study Revelation some time ago now. And we, we saw throughout all of Revelation, even after the rapture of the church, God deals with Israel after the rapture. And the whole point of that is that God is not done with Israel. Even, even when the church is raptured and the church is out of here, God is still going to be dealing with Israel. And hopefully at that point, and, and, and at that point, million, probably millions of Jewish people will come to know Christ and serve Christ. Because after the tribul or during the tribulation, they will they will recognize, oh my goodness, this is this is God. You know, Jesus is God. Although there'll be some that don't, but there'll be many that do. Okay, so so um, let, let me say this uh, first of all. So we're starting at verse number six, and uh, this section ends at, at the end of chapter nine, so verse thirty six. So all that he says, it could be very dry, okay? But he summarizes the whole thing in verses 30, 30 31, and 32. So let me read the summary so you, you kind of get an idea of where this is going. He says, what shall we say then? The famous line of Paul. You know, what do we say then? Or what do we do now? Or, you know, that, that's his famous line. Well, that Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness have attained to righteousness, even the righteousness of faith. But Israel, pursuing the law of righteousness, has not attained to the law of righteousness. So you have the Gentiles that were saved by faith, and you have the Jews that were trying to get saved by keeping the law, and it amounted to nothing. It, it didn't amount to, uh, that, that has not attained to the law of righteousness, verse number 31. Why? Why? Because they did not seek it by faith. But as it were, by the works of the law. This is what he's saying the whole time. Obeying the law, you could never obey the law, first of all. But even if you could, it, it would never be enough to save you. For they stumbled at that stumbling stone. And then it quotes that verse uh, from uh, the Old Testament that Jesus is the stumbling block. Or the, the chief uh, stone, the cornerstone that was rejected and has become a stumbling block. So, so between verse 6 and verse 30 is all this information that God's, God has been dealing with Israel and, 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 and uh, is giving Israel an opportunity. So verse number 6. Okay. Verse number 6. This is not that the word of God has taken no effect. So, so you know, verses four and five, or three and four, or no, one, two and three, Paul is saying, "I have a burden for Israel." Verses four and five, you know, you guys have the word, you have the law, you have all these things, 
But verse 6, not that the word hasn't had any effect, because the word has had an effect. For they are not all Israel who are of Israel. Oh, 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 oh. So all of Israel is not Israel. Let's go back to chapter 2, just for a second here. 2.28. He is not a Jew, Romans 2.28, who is one inwardly. I'm sorry. He is not a Jew who is one outwardly, nor is circumcision that which is outward in the flesh. But he is a Jew who is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart, in the spirit, not of the letter, whose praise is not of men, but of God. So Paul's saying, if you want to be part of Israel, you know, you're, you're, you're part of Israel by faith in Jesus Christ. I think in Galatians, I just thought of it now, I should have checked earlier. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, I don't see it. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Galatians 6, 16. He, he refers to the church as the Israel of God. As many as walk according to this rule, peace and mercy upon them and upon the Israel of God. So, I mean, not to make a big point out of this, but we could say, based on what Paul is saying, that we Christians are Israel. We're the real Israel. Because we're the, if we're Gentiles, we're the wild olive trees that were grafted into the olive tree. And, and so we're, our root goes back to, to, uh, to Abraham, not genetically. You know, we're not of any tribe or anything like that. But we go back through faith, uh, back to Abraham. So verse, uh, verse 7. Nor are they all... Children, because they are of the seed of Abraham, but in Isaac your seed shall be called. I'm going to read the next verse. That is, those who are of the children of the flesh, uh, that is, those who are the children of the flesh, these are not the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted as the seed. All right, so I got five minutes. Let me, let me just talk to you. I found this passage really interesting because... In verse 7, it says, uh, Nor are they all children because they are the seed of Abraham, but in Isaac your seed shall be called. Well, that opens up a whole can of worms right there. Because as you know, Abraham had another son through Hagar. And there's another cross-reference in Galatians, which we'll get to next week. But, okay, so he's saying a couple of things here. You, and, and, and so it's Abraham, Isaac, in verse number 13, he talks about Jacob. So he's talking about the, the, the sons, the seed comes from the, 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 the seed comes from Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But it doesn't come from genetics. Just because you're Jewish, right, does not make you, you know, a seed of Abraham. Although up until now, that's what it was. You were of the seed of Abraham if you were genetically linked to Abraham. But, but here, I, I, you know, Muhammad came around in, what, 610 A.D.? I just wonder, I haven't even thought about this, but I wonder if the children of Ishmael, who were the children of Abraham and Hagar, uh, you know, the maidservant of Sarah, because Sarah and Abraham jumped the gun and wanted, wanted to have this son going because they were old or whatever. And Abraham did have another son called Ishmael. And, and, but right here, the, the children will not come from any other seed of Abraham but through Isaac and then Jacob. <clears throat> not through Ishmael. But even if it was, even if, it, even if you did have a seed through Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, or even if you had a seed through Ishmael, it wouldn't matter anyway, because you're not part of the family based upon genetics. What he's talking about is your faith has to be grounded and rooted in the faith going back to Abraham through the, the 12 tribes, through uh, Jacob, through Isaac, and then Abraham. And, and if, if you reverse that, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, the 12 tribes, 
and all the rest, and finally through Jesus Christ, Messiah, that's where our faith comes from. It's not genetics, it's through faith that we're saved. Romans 1, 16 and 17, which is the whole theme of the, of the, God, of the, of the book of Romans. So I just throw that in about Ishmael because the whole, the whole study of Islam is very interesting. And Muslims, Jews, and Christians all trace their lineage back to Abraham and back to Jerusalem, as a matter of fact. I just wonder at the time when this was written, I haven't read anything about it, were there the sons of Ishmael around that laid claim to some type of promises or something? Because there are some promises made to Ishmael, his descendants, that they would be, be prosperous and so forth. And the Middle East certainly is prosperous with all the oil. But, uh, but anyway, that will never get you to, the, to become a, a part of the seed of Abraham. The, the genetics will not do it. Uh, the seed is only birthed through faith in Jesus Christ. That's why we Gentiles could say, we are of the seed of Abraham. We've been grafted in through faith into that olive tree. Okay, well, I'm going to have to wrap it up right here. But a uh, very interesting study. Uh, so we'll, we'll pick up next week, uh, Romans 9. We'll probably start at verse 6 and really get into it. Um, very interesting passage. A little confusing, but... Uh, what Paul is saying is the Jewish people who he had a burden for had everything laid out for them, but they're not going to get it through genetics and through genealogy. They're going to get it through faith in Jesus Christ, which is, again, the theme of the whole book of Romans, chapter 1, verses 16 and 17. All righty. Well, let's see if I, if I miss some people here. Thank you all for joining us tonight. Uh, really glad that you're here. Uh, ladies, remember that uh, there is a Zoom meeting for you tomorrow at 7. I'm, I'm sorry, on Friday. There's a Zoom meeting for the ladies Friday at 7. Uh, please contact Stacy. I'll be sending an email out tomorrow about that. Uh, Friday at 7, Sisterhood. Uh, all the men, uh, please uh, sign into the Zoom meeting with Wayne Zanke at 7 o'clock tomorrow. And uh, also feel free to check out our YouTube page. Uh, New Life Haverhill, or you can go to our website page, and that'll take you to the YouTube page. And check out uh, Sunday Sermon, uh, Sunday Night Prayer Meeting, uh, the Children's Ministry from Sunday Afternoon. It's all there for you. And uh, we're trying to do the best we can to, to keep our correspondence, keep our camaraderie, keep our fellowship going. Uh, although we can't meet, most of us can't meet. Uh, so please take advantage of those things, okay? All right, I'm going to close out in prayer and sign out. I'll, I'll respond to all the comments um, after I say amen. Okay, let's pray. Lord God, thank you for tonight. Lord, thank you for your word. Your word is definitely life to us. And uh, Lord, I, I pray that you give us a burden. As Paul had a burden for the Jewish people, I pray, Lord, that you give us a burden for people, whether it's whatever, whoever, maybe it's our family, Maybe it's people that are down and out. Maybe it's people that are wrapped up in drugs or street life or maybe people in prison, maybe the nursing homes. Uh, maybe we have a burden for the, uh, the community leaders here in Haverhill that, aren't, that don't have a walk with you that we know of. Uh, give us a burden, Lord. Give us, give us a group of people that we pray for consistently and uh, let us see your hand move mightily amongst those people. So, Lord, thank you. Uh, we leave all our prayer requests in your hands right now. We thank you for your word. We, we pray as we sign off that we'll be encouraged tonight and have a good rest of the night, a good night's sleep. Let us be healthy and strong. Lord, may this coronavirus subside. We pray for other areas of the country to, to have healing and, uh, and for this disease to, be, uh, to come to an end. We pray, Lord, for the social unrest, for the racial unrest, to subside in our country, and for your church to be a voice of reason and to be a voice of prophecy. For where the Spirit of Christ is proclaimed, there's a spirit of prophecy, according to Revelation 19. Let us be a prophetic voice. Let us be a voice of reason in these difficult days. May your anointing be upon us. We thank you. We praise you for it now. In Jesus' name we pray. Hallelujah. And everybody said, Amen. And amen. Well, thank you for joining us. 
I'll see you soon, okay? I'll see the men tomorrow night, Lord willing, 7 o'clock. Adios.